Hear now the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 24. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that has made the gold sacred? But you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. You are probably familiar with the stories and the legends of King Arthur. Um, they're among the many legendary stories of King Arthur. Perhaps none are as well known as the story of the sword in the stone, uh, about a sword that was magically locked partway into a stone, and with the promise that whoever would uh, be able to pull it out was identi would identify himself by that act as the true king of England. Now, with that being the promise, you can imagine how many men would have tried to pull that sword out of the stone. And so there are great feats of strength and people imagining that if they could just get the right amount of leverage or they could just do it in the right way, they could perhaps pull this stone, a sword, out of the stone and thereby become the king of England. The problem was, if you know this story, that they were making wrong assumptions about how this challenge, how this test was supposed to work. It, it wasn't a feat of strength. It wasn't a test of... Who is the really strong man who can pull this sword out of the stone? The test was one of character, not a matter of strength. And because they made the wrong assumptions, they went about this entirely in the wrong way until the right man came along, King Arthur, who was able effortlessly to pull this sword out of the stone. Now, when we come to the Bible, we have another story throughout the entire Scriptures a story that is trying to identify the rightful king. Not the rightful king over England, but the rightful king over Israel, the rightful king over God's people. And throughout this story, we see a lot of assumptions about how this rightful king is going to be identified. People thought he would look like David. He would be a man of, of warfare, a very strong man who would lead the people against the Romans. And people thought that particularly, that the way they would rightly relate to this strong warrior man uh, would be to a right performance of religion. They thought that if they could just do the right things in the right way, that they would rightly relate to this coming king. And so the best and the strongest of them, not necessarily physically, but externally, religiously, by their noblest efforts, would try and try and attempt to teach others the same, but they were never able to construct a, a system that would solve the great problem of sin that was revealed by the law. Because the Bible is not a legend, it's not mythology, it's not fiction. It is true history and reveals the story of God's divine work behind the, the details of history to lead toward the revelation of the true king. But this true king is not who the people thought it was. They had the wrong assumptions about what the test of the law of God meant. When the law of God pointed to the man, Jesus Christ, the religious leaders denied him, but Jesus is here confronting that the very system they have constructed to try to reveal themselves as the best and the strongest, who would be able to rightly relate to the strong man king of Israel who would be revealed at one point, Jesus exposes why their best efforts are failing, 
and why they misunderstood the very test of the law that was put in front of them in the first place. The big idea is just as the people misunderstood that the wrong way to lift the sword out of the stone, the big idea we see here is that only the gospel can lift the weight of the law. Only the gospel can lift the weight of the law. We see three parts to this story here. First of all, a burdensome gospel, the burdensome gospel of the the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus rebukes here. Second, blind guides, blind guides who minimized holiness in the first part. And then third, the blind guides who externalized righteousness. So blind guides have minimized holiness and blind guides, third, of externalized righteousness. We'll start, though, in this first section of the burdensome gospel of the scribes and the Pharisees. If you remember the first 12 verses of this passage, uh, starting in, at the beginning of Matthew chapter 23, Jesus was speaking there to the crowds and the disciples. So we read that in verse 1. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. And to do so, he was warning them that the way in which they were approaching God, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, was not the right way to relate to God. And so by these warnings, uh, Jesus was speaking about the religious leaders, but really had a different audience in mind. Well, now Jesus is certainly indeed warning all the people who are listening to him, the crowds and his disciples, but here he is speaking directly to the scribes and the Pharisees. And to speak to them in verse 13, Jesus begins with the first of what will be seven woes. These woes are words that Jesus uh, uses to deliver uh, sometimes what is a simply, um, as Don Carson writes, a compassionate alas. So in the next chapter, in 24, verse 19, Jesus says, alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. He's not blaming them for the judgment that is going to fall on Jerusalem in those days. He is simply compassionately saying, this will be a terrible thing for them when they have to undergo that ordeal. But here, however, while this indeed includes compassion as Jesus warns the scribes and the Pharisees of their error, Jesus is also doing so by giving them a strong condemnation. He is directly rebuking them for the ways in which they are relating to religion, particularly relating to their God. What we have in these woes, and again, Jesus gives seven woes in this chapter— is really the inverse, the opposite of the Beatitudes back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. There Jesus gave a statement that blessed are those who do this or that or the other. And the thing about those Beatitudes is they were surprising because they seemed to be a, a contrary to all appearances. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, they don't seem to be blessed, and yet Jesus assures us, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes on and on. And everywhere there's something that is contrary to what seems to be the case, Jesus asserts it as a fact of blessedness. Well, here, although the scribes and the Pharisees were seen to be the ones who had the right, uh, right stuff all together, Jesus was assuring that they were to be pitied. Woe upon them. Because according to appearances, they seem to be strong in religion, but they are in fact under the condemnation of God. So the first thing that Jesus issues a woe for, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, in verse 13, as he says, for or because you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Now when Jesus says this, You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. He is imagining these religious leaders to function as a kind of doorkeeper, a doorkeeper to the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is like what Jesus said when Peter confessed in Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when Peter confessed that, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven... I tell you the truth, you were Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he said, for I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. When Jesus talked about the keys to the kingdom of heaven, he was saying that the task of his apostles, Peter among his apostles, was to serve as doorkeepers to open and shut the doors of heaven. 
And particularly, the first task of the ministers of the Word, the apostles and then those who are appointed as ministers of the Word, including pastors to this day, their task is to open the doors of the kingdom of heaven by clearly teaching and preaching God's Word, the gospel of Jesus Christ in God's Word. And when Jesus Christ is preached, the, the doors to the kingdom of heaven are opened. Because for any who hear this word of the gospel of Jesus Christ and repent for their sins and trust in Jesus will indeed be saved. However, these priests and these scribes and these Pharisees, though according to old covenant declarations, they were given the task of teaching God's word, they did not rightly do so. Uh, one of the parallel passages where we see Jesus uttering similar condemnations in one of the other gospels is in Luke chapter 11 verse 52 where Jesus says, woe to you lawyers. Lawyers were like scribes. They were those who were experts in the law. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. They've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering, that is entering into the kingdom of heaven. But this is something that Jesus, or that, that God also says through his prophet in the Old Testament. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, in the Old Testament, the Lord laments, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because their teachers took away the key of knowledge. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. He's speaking to his priests who were tasked with teaching God's word to the people. But because they did not rightly teach God's word, the key of knowledge was taken away, that people lacked knowledge, and they were destroyed. And this is exactly the same criticism and condemnation that Jesus is pronouncing here in the New Testament. The same thing that was happening in the Old Testament is happening in the New. They've taken away the key of knowledge. They have therefore shut the doors to the kingdom of heaven so that people cannot enter into the key kingdom of heaven. They shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Now, what, the, what they did, what the scribes and the Pharisees did to burden the people in this way was that they made God's Word burdensome. They put heavy weights on the people, as Jesus says in, in verse 4, earlier in this passage, in the previous passage we looked at last time. They, the scribes and Pharisees, tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. As John writes in 1 John 5, verse 3, God's commandments are not burdensome. What the scribes and the Pharisees were doing was they were making the law heavy by holding the law out to people as something that if they would just obey, at least in the ways that the scribes and the Pharisees taught them to, they could be saved. But the law is heavy to sinners. Sinners cannot lift the law. It is not a matter of strength any more than it was a feat of strength to try to lift out the sword in King Arthur's day and those stories. The law was a crushing weight that was laid upon the people if it was held out to them as a means by which they might find salvation. And yet the scribes and the Pharisees taught that the people could indeed be saved in precisely this way. And in fact, we read in verse 15 that they had a kind of missionary zeal to spread this burdensome gospel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. They rescued the heathen nations from paganism, but they brought those pagans out of their false religion, which was indeed something that would condemn them, and brought them into legalism. Legalism that would just as much condemn them. They brought them out of the frying pan, and they brought them directly into the fire. Now, what these teachers of the law were supposed to be doing was to declare to the people that they should be waiting the coming king. You know, again, I think there's a really good illustration, that legend of Arthur. They should be waiting for the one who has the right character, who can come along and, and lift that sword from the stone. But rather than doing that, the scribes and the Pharisees taught people strategies, ineffective strategies, to try to pull the sword from the stone themselves according to their own strength in terms of religious scruples, in terms of trying to keep things together in terms of external ceremonies. 
The fact that all of those plans and efforts failed did not matter. They continued to teach and insist that those efforts were the most important thing, and they would condemn and criticize and belittle anyone whose efforts they deemed to be less effective than theirs. At best, those who followed the systems taught by the scribes and the Pharisees were hypocritical and proud, and at the worst, those who lived under that tyranny were demoralized. How could anyone, certainly how could I, a sinner, live up to that standard? Neither were great options, and both made them doubly a child of hell. Now, I say this because I know that some of you are here today with crushing burdens on your back religiously. You have heard, whether explicitly or implicitly, that you could be saved by some program of externalized behavior. That if you followed a specific set of spiritual disciplines, or if you simply would be very careful to avoid certain sins, or would be very careful to practice certain virtues, or if you simply tried to keep up with signaling your virtue for by saying the right things about whatever the cause of the day is, or if you sent your money into the right cause, or you prayed a very specific prayer that was taught to you, that all of these would be methods that would finally, once for all, pull that sword from the stone. But human religion is something that is always and endlessly under construction. Every time whatever program that was foist upon you didn't work, your life wasn't transformed, you never found any peace of mind. You certainly didn't find any peace with God. Every time each of those efforts failed, you simply moved on to a new construction project. The next effort, the next method, the next rite and ritual and ceremony. It's like the Tower of Babel, always building and constantly frustrated before you can reach your goal. Relentless effort ceaseless activity, constant pursuit of self-improvement, and nothing to show for it at the end of the day. All of this is exhausting. No matter how hard you pull, the sword does not budge. What the leaders who foist this upon you falsely call a gospel, they claim to be good news, because, but it is only a crushing burden. The gospel of Jesus, however, is the opposite of that. The gospel of Jesus is truly gospel. It is truly good news. That's what that word gospel means. Because the gospel of Jesus is not a program for what you must do to be saved. It is a declaration of what Jesus Christ has done. Jesus Christ underwent the crushing weight of the wrath of God. Something that you and I could never bear. It would only overflow for all eternity infinitely in God's holiness against the wrath of our infinitely guilty uh, uh, sin. But what we could not bear up under, Jesus Christ could. Why? Because He was not only true man, He was true God. He was the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, who was able to absorb and extinguish the fullness of the wrath of God against you. He took all of your curse, and not only that, He also perfectly fulfilled every last requirement of righteousness that God demanded from you. He pulled the sword from the stone finally once for all in the stone that was rolled away on the day of His resurrection, where everything was finished and where He was raised up in victory over sin, death, and the devil forever. And He did this in your place, not for something that you must slavishly try to replicate for yourself. You can't do this. But He offers it to you freely to be received by nothing more than faith. Only this gospel can lift the weight of the law. Only this gospel can take of, off of your back the crushing burden. If you ever read Pilgrim's Progress, this is what Pilgrim is, is stumbling under at the beginning of the story. He's got that weight of the burden of sin on his back, and he cannot wait to get rid of it. But no one can rid it for him until he comes to the foot of the cross where it falls off. Never to be seen again. But this is precisely what Israel's teachers do not teach. This is precisely what many religions who offer you methods and rituals and ceremonies by which you may be saved teach to you. Jesus is furious at these teachings. 
They must continue to expose them partially that their gospel cannot attain what they seek to gain. And worse than that, that they are going in the wrong direction. These ways that they teach to find salvation actually make the people increasingly guilty. And so in the next two sections, Jesus gives more woes where he calls in both sections the religious leaders to be blind guides, blind guides. And in both places, Jesus talks about different aspects of this blindness. In the first section, really the second section of the sermon, but the first part of the blind guide nature of these religious teachers, is that they offer a minimized holiness. That's what we're going to see in verses 16 through 22. Let me read this again. He says, Woe to you blind guides, there it is, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. He is bound by his oath, you blind fools, for which is greater the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath, you blind men, for which is greater the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Now, to modern readers, I think this is a very strange kind of discussion. Why is Jesus talking about oaths? Well, this isn't something that we think all that often about. But in Jesus' day among first century Jews, this was a big topic of conversation. Uh, Leon Morris explains that there was a whole tractate of the Mishnah, so sort of a standard Jewish rabbinical teaching that was given to the subjects of oaths. It's called Shavuot. And in this extended tractate, this extended writing, there were all kinds of distinctions that were drawn. That if you say this when you swear an oath, that would indeed be binding. But if you alter how you swear and instead swear it by a slightly different formation... You will, in fact, not be bound by that oath because of whatever reason that justifies you from not keeping that oath. Now, the reasons that the rabbis wanted to teach this kind of detailed analysis of which oaths were binding and which were not is they wanted to clarify how to keep the law as God's people. What would it mean to keep God's law? Well, it means you do this in this circumstance and this in that circumstance. But the way they approached this was by endless hair-splitting of which oaths were binding and which were not. Now, the oaths were one example of many kinds of approaches to different aspects of the law, one of many. But I think it's really important that Jesus is picking up on something that seems to be an issue of the smallest external consequences. What he wants to do is to show that the system is corrupt all the way from the very basics, all the way from oath-keeping, And then the way that Jesus is going to end in the last woe is he's going to talk about their violence and their murders. So Jesus is starting as something of the seemingly the lowest part of their morality, and he's going to move to seemingly the highest part of their immorality. And what Jesus wants to show is that from top to bottom, from the least to the greatest, what they are offering is corrupt through and through. And so what Jesus does is he observes and takes apart They're tied in knots legalism by showing how they have come to absurd conclusions about which which oaths are binding and which are not by missing important connections. So they said, well, to swear by the temple, that was not binding, but to swear by the gold in the temple, the gold was kept in the Holy of Holies. So to swear by that, that was what made, that was something that would be binding. However, it was the temple that Jesus points out that makes the gold holy. Or to swear by the altar, that's nothing. But to swear by the gift, that's what's really offered to the Lord. That would indeed be binding, hair-splitting distinctions. What Jesus goes on to say is that it is God himself who dwells in his temple and in his heavens on his throne where he sits. And even more than this, if you think about it, it's God's glory, as the scriptures say, that fill the whole earth as the waters cover the seas which means that there is nothing you can swear by in all of creation without invoking God or something that God has made in a place where God dwells. There is no way, therefore, to avoid obligation in the oaths that we utter because to swear by anything and to break it is a violation of God's holiness. 
Now, when we talked about a similar thing that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And he talked about some of these distinctions that were made then. We talked about the fact in Matthew chapter 5 that what Jesus was getting at is that God's law is infinitely high as heaven itself. The requirements of God are infinitely high as heaven itself. But legalism is always looking for loopholes. It's always trying to minimize holiness, the requirements, especially to external requirements. If I just do this and I don't do that, then I will be safe. Because legalism is constantly seeking to justify ourselves. This is the heart of human religion. Human religion attempts to pursue holiness by setting up arbitrary rules. But even then, they cannot follow those rules. I don't know if you've ever played a game with children. A game that children may have invented on the spot. Hey, let's play this game, and you do this, and I'll do that. Great, let's play the game. Well, once you get into that game, if you've played those games, you know that very quickly, particularly after you have won or scored a point, that you learn that there were rules that you had not discovered up to that point, that now the children are very happy to share with you. I'm sorry, you cannot do that in that way. Okay, so tell me the rules. So now you do that. Oh, no, no, you actually had to do this differently this time around. That was just for the last time. This time it's going to be different this time around. Or if it's a game of tag, well, didn't you know that this is all also base, and the rules go on and on and on. But this isn't just children. This is all of our hearts. The human heart is constantly working to justify my own actions. You see, I want to believe, I really want to believe in my heart of hearts that I can get this close to the line of sin. I can sort of have some aspect of whatever it is that I want in sin, so long as I don't go past that. Okay, I'm safe there. But then, oops, oh, I, I did go past the line. And then I have to redraw all the rules in my line. I said, well, okay, I really went past the line in this way and not that way, so I, th I think I'm still safe. Well, oops, then again, I go past the law in that or the line in that way. But then I start to say, well, but I had a really hard day that day. And on and on and on. Does this sound like the rationalizations and the self-justification of your heart? Our hearts are factories of excuses. Our hearts are factories for self-justification. Why? Because we want to define the line by which if we can just cross it, we will be justified. We will be holy in God's sight. And it is an infinitely far short gap from what God actually requires in His infinitely high requirements of the righteousness of God. The gospel of Jesus cuts entirely through that logic. And this is such good news. Let me tell you why it's not good news. It's not good news because what the gospel of Jesus begins with is an announcement that you are guilty, that you cannot justify yourself even by your best works. But the good news of the gospel announces that you don't have to try to justify yourself anymore. You don't have to tie up a nice bow on your sin in your unholiness, in hopes that God will somehow be, accept, be accepting of it because you've packaged it well. What the gospel simply calls us to do is to turn from our sin for the first time and the thousandth time, to turn from our sin in repentance, because we can bring nothing to God but our sin, and yet we cannot minimize it, we cannot hide it, we cannot excuse it, we cannot justify it. We simply bring it to God and lay it at the foot of Christ's cross. You may know that Martin Luther um, said, sin boldly. Sin boldly. Now, that's a shocking statement. But let me tell you what he didn't mean by that. He didn't mean that you should sin so that grace may abound. The Scriptures reject that idea, and that's not what he was arguing. The point that he was making is that we should sin boldly because we cannot sin carefully. In other words, stop this pretense that if you can just do the right thing in the right way, or if you can just sin carefully so that you don't cross whatever line you are pretending to keep today, that you can thereby keep yourself safe from sin. You can have this much of sin without actually entering into guilt. The only way that you can be found righteous is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus continues at this point in time. And he gives the final 
section of woes that we're going to look at today, where he says that they not only minimize the holiness that we need, but also they externalize the righteous requirements of God. So in this third section, once again, Jesus calls them out as blind guides of externalized righteousness. In verse 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Now, stop here for a moment. What Jesus says is that the scribes and the Pharisees are putting a huge emphasis on external matters. Earlier, he talked about this very minimally external consequence issue of oath-taking, but here Jesus is talking about tithing. And what these Pharisees were very scrupulous to do was to tithe. Tithe is a word that means to give 10%, to give tithes of each spice they possessed. Now, I think it's important to notice that Jesus commends this. He says, these you ought to have done. Tithing is a very general biblical principle. We see it all the way from the very beginning of the Bible in the Old Testament, in the days of Abraham and Jacob, even before the giving of the ceremonial Mosaic law. You see this all the way from the beginning. It's a general biblical principle that we are still to observe to this day. But the idea here is that the problem was not in their tithing. The problem was in the externality of their righteousness. While they were busy weighing out mint leaves— They neglected the weightier matters of the law. They lost sight. They were looking at this one small detail, and they thought that would be what would justify them because it was external. And they neglected these weightier matters of the law. Now, the way Jesus illustrates this is in verse 24, where he says, you blind guides, that's where that criticism comes up again, you blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Now, understand a gnat was an insect, and therefore it was unclean. It was good and right for them, according to their ceremonial religion, to strain out the gnat, not just because it was gross, but because it would have been unclean for them. But what Jesus says is you're so focused on that issue, which you should do, that you were led then to swallow a camel. You you don't pay attention to what is much bigger in your life. And Jesus is showing that this is an absolute absurdity. Now, what Jesus is showing here is an approach to religion, an approach to trying to commend ourselves to God that is characterized by legalism through and through. It's showing a way of trying to lift the sword from the stone that is based on strength and personal grit and perseverance and scrupulousness. The application then to heed these warnings that Jesus is offering is this. Embrace the gospel of Jesus as your only hope to lift the weight of the law. The law of God is an infinitely high as heaven standard that God has given to demand the righteousness that God expects from us. All of us, however, have fallen short of the glory of God. And because we are sinners, because we have fallen short of the glory of God, our only hope is to find some way back into God's good standing, into a righteous standing before God. Now, there are two false ways at trying to relate to the law that God has given. One is to reject the law altogether, to say, I don't have to follow that. God will accept me even if I ignore the law. Theologians call that antinomianism, antinomianism. Or, and this is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to do, we can construct a system by which we deceive ourselves into success where we try to look for loopholes and we create these arbitrary and false rules. The border goes this far and no further, and I can do this, but you can't. This is called legalism, where we end up piling up all kinds of rules of when an oath is binding and not, instead of just obeying what God said, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, I think we sometimes think about these as two very different ways of relating to God's law. Some people by temperament or just antinomian. Others, by temperament, are legalists. Some people get rid of rules. Some people pile up rules. But I think it's important to see that biblically, these two approaches to the law are two sides of the exact same coin. If you want to read a book of this, Sinclair Ferguson wrote the book called The Whole Christ. And it's a really helpful book for talking about how antinomianism and legalism are the exact same thing. Uh, The biblical example that Ferguson gives, he points to the Garden of Eden, where Eve legalistically sought to keep the command that she had, which was not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
by adding her legalistic requirement, neither shall you touch it. Now that's legalism. It's trying to keep God's law by setting up fences and by saying, I'm not going to go this far. I don't, wouldn't want to go across that law, another law or another boundary for it. And I think I can keep that by not even touching it. That's legalism. But eventually, the serpent used her legalism to try to plant the seed into her mind that God was not good and that God was, in fact, withholding something good for her. Eventually, so that Eve cast off the law altogether. She was the first antinomian. She was the first one to do away with the law, to do what she wanted to do instead of what the law did, and she ate from the fruit. And all of us have been legalistic antinomians since then. Whenever we try to establish a false holiness, a false righteousness, we end up casting off God's law altogether to become defiled and guilty. Because there is no true path to God's holiness and righteousness apart from faith in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you why this is such a liberating message. Because we so often are trying to do something. If I just keep this pattern, if I just follow these ceremonies, if I just pray these prayers at these times of day, if I just do these things that have been set by the patterns of others, then I will be safe. But this human religion is tyranny. It's bondage. It is a crushing weight that is placed upon our shoulders that makes us children of hell. It gains us nothing and loses us everything. The Scriptures, however, hold out the key of knowledge. The Scriptures hold out the gospel that opens the doors to the kingdom of heaven. Would you find rest for your souls? Would you find joy in the midst of sorrow? Would you find holiness to cleanse your corruption? Would you find righteousness to cover your guilt? All of this Jesus Christ holds out to you. Not something that you may carefully and scrupulously put together and assemble for yourself by a very cleverly constructed system. But he holds out to you in what he has already done through his life and death and resurrection. Therefore, cast off everything else. There are so many voices telling you, you will be safe. You will be in the right if you just do this. Cast it all off. Put away all hopes of self-improvement except for what the Scriptures hold out as they identify the true King of God's people, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came, who lived, who died, and who on the third day rose again, vindicated as the righteous Son of God, and who ascended into heaven where He is now seated at the right hand of His Father and reigning until the day when He will come again. He is your hope, He is your King, He is your righteousness and your sanctification from God. Trust in Him. Only He is able to lift the burden of the law. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that You would indeed give us Jesus Christ. We have no hope apart from Him. We pray that You would give us Christ crucified. We pray that You would give us Christ, our Lord and Savior, for the forgiveness of our sins and for the cleansing of our iniquity. We pray that we would be counted as righteous in Christ. We pray that we would be made holy through Christ's cleansing blood. And we pray that we would do all of this as we relate to Him through faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.